Good morning. I think we'd like to get started. Hopefully you're staying and not going. I'd like to welcome you to our, our panel presentation today. Last week on my way to class, I was walking behind two women, two young students, and they were talking about their courses. When I happened to overhear one of them tell the other, ChatGPT has been really helpful with my coursework. Her friend agreed. She said, it's easy. They weren't talking in hushed tones. In fact, they were talking so clearly that their voices were clear to me as I was walking behind them and easily intercepted. Which leads me to a basic premise. I would like to hold a truth as self-evident. It's not whether students are using AI, but how and why they do. Perhaps the more valuable tool and focal point for inquiry is not if students are using ChatGPT, but how and why the first premise we as teachers can't control. The second two, I think we can, or at least think about a little bit more. I wanted to show some definitive statistics on the matter, but in essence, the number of people using ChatGPT, particularly college students, is increasing so exponentially, it's hard to find a survey that is keeping up. By one count, in a three-month period in the spring, college student use of ChatGPT in at least some significant instance rose from 38% to almost 50. And that was in spring. What's it now? I can tell you anecdotally that more broadly, related to the topic we cover in classes, over 90% of my students in my classes over the past three years have admitted to cheating or finding workarounds, openly admitting this in their high school coursework. Or we can deliberate on the ethics of ChatGPT and whether or not it's moral in some capacity or immoral. But that's not why we're here today. Today our panel will consider the how of ChatGPT in the classroom setting. And Claude, its close relative, as representative of the technology, and the why of AI's potential uses. Dr. McCalla will present first to show real examples of how ChatGPT and other like engines generate responses to real essay prompts and how that differs from in real life. Dr. DeToro will focus on the nature of ChatGPT and Claude, which despite its enthusiastic parroting, is meant to chat and not critique, not at least at a college level. I, Dr. Doyle, I'll round out our discussion and ask you to consider the traits that make up our student population, young adults. It's my research. I have my PhD in education specialties focusing on young adult literacy. And I've spent the last three years asking students what makes them more engaged in their classrooms. By reflecting, we can perhaps consider how to relay to the students we teach the true value of technology, which like every significant technology before it, which has historically infiltrated the educational landscape, is made to be used productively or to be abused, depending on the vision of the educator. Before we get there, I'd like you to join in one interactive exercise. I'd like you to grab hold of this Padlet, use your phones, and I want you to think of three adjectives, which this, that, think of three specific learning, and a specific learning experience from which you truly benefited and list three adjectives or three short phase, phrases that, ex, that describe that experience that made it memorable and or valuable to you. If you're a student, I'd ask that you put in that you are a student. Just curious to see what we come to. We can take a couple of minutes right now. Panel, would you like to as well? Ha, <laughs> 
<laughs> That's all right. I'll put you on the spot. I use Padlet in my classroom. It keeps my students awake. It's like the whiteboard of, of today. You don't have to put your name. So I also ask my students if they remember what they learned in high school or in any class for that matter that they've taken prior to coming into my classroom. And I ask them to impart to me something that they learned. And this is a, this is a distinction that I would like to make. There is a difference between complying with educational requirements and be actually being engaged in those requirements so you they take that learning with you as you go further on in life. We'll come back to this at the end, but right now I'd like to introduce Dr. McCalla. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm appreciative of the Padlet just now, and I saw some of the student responses, and one of the things that always strikes me is when students talk about their professors, um, a passionate professor, a professor that cares. Um, thank you. And that's how they're truly getting engaged in class. So initially, and that's something that I've always heard, initially when I think of Claude and ChatGPT and our other AI um, softwares, I'm saying, I'm going to lose them. I'm going to lose my students because they're going to do this, which I find dispassionate. These, they're not giving me who they are, the students, in their writing. Um, the examples that I'm about to show you, um, if I can preface, on its face, prima facie will give us this difference, right, of what the software returns and what the students are going to return. And initially for the teachers, professors, instructors in the room, it's almost like this red flag. Oh, I think I, this is a student writing this. Or, oh, I think software gave this to me. And I think that's um, the top layer only of what this is really going to do in our classroom. So I'm, we're going to start... Um, seeing those differences, but then talking about how I believe continually engaging and maybe even changing the way I am giving writing assignments, how I'm teaching in the classroom, that word passionate just keeps coming up, um, thereby either A, giving us a platform to utilize GPT or, or the software in a different way, but still keep our students engaged and giving us something that they think is important. I think one of the things that we really need to connect with and think about is how we are teaching our students or giving our students a, a space that their knowledge is important. And so that not necessarily taking um, the AI out of the classroom, but giving students a different way of using it, a way that doesn't let them think that this is the knowledge the professor only wants to see. Okay. So... I have an assignment that I love, 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 love to use. One of those assignments, it's, um, it's after reading and discussing Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail. And it is an assignment that says, you're writing a letter from Rikers Island. Um, I'm starting to see that that's changing. A lot of people don't even know what Rikers Island is. Um, some of my students are like, why would I even go to jail? And so I'm starting to tailor this differently with that. But... Um, with the rise of AI, I have to tailor it differently as well. So let's just begin. 
and I can't see a thing. All right. So we will see in the first on the right the return. And I obviously didn't put the entire thing. It's just too much. Um, the intro paragraph of AI's return. And I believe I used Claude for this one. And it's I'm writing from my prison cell where I've been confined. And we can see these things. And then we've got the students' responses on the, oh, I'm sorry, I meant the left, on the right. I'm sorry. Okay. Thanks. And we see that the students' responses are much more reflective of feeling. Much, And I'm not trying to say, well, I am trying to say computers can't feel. But what we're trying, what I'm trying to show is that from the discussion prior, when we discussed the letter from Birmingham jail, when we discussed not just the writing aspects of it, Dr. King knows his audience. Dr. King knows how to reach these people. He's giving them knowledge. He is totally viable. He knows what he's doing. The students are then turning this around and giving themselves a platform for a voice, right? They are allowed to use the pronoun I. They are allowed to tell the professor anything they want. This license somehow does stretch the limit of syntax. I get that. Um, but what it's doing is giving us a much clearer picture of what the students want to tell us. I think sometimes when we are allowed to give that latitude, we give less space for AI to give its knowledge premise. In other words, students sometimes are looking, when I do ask, as Adele said earlier, you know, they, they come out and say, yeah, yeah, I have either cheated or used the AI. And when I ask why, I want it to be correct. I want to get an A. And I want you, eventually, if I drill down enough, or if they're open enough after I've drilled down enough, I want to tell you what you want me to tell you. And I think the AI is good at that, right? And the students are realizing, if the students realize that that's not what I want, I want your knowledge, and we discuss it together, these are the kinds of responses we get. So my fellow kamikazes, and I haven't gotten that in a while because some of my students don't know what that is. I'm here in jail. I'm wondering if this was all worth it. Um, free to say what we want. And I think this reflexive exercise starts to give students a latitude. And this is why I actually um, put this um, assignment earlier in their semester, because it builds a sort of trust that I do care what you think. And I do care that it's not 100% syntactically correct and grammatically correct. I mean, we work on those things, but what we're doing is building a trust for knowledge sharing. Um, so what happened is for the purposes of this presentation, the prompts for the essays are gradually, um, excuse me, exponentially shortened um, for, so that they could fit on the slide, right? Write a letter from jail after you've been arrested for your beliefs. Make sure the audience is clear. And that actually means make sure I am clear on who your audience is, why they should care, what action you want them to take. This is an assignment sheet that's actually much longer and broader, giving students a lot of points because students want to be told, right? We're dealing with students, and this is an undergraduate, um, these are undergraduate um, responses, but I find that as a, as a professor, I'm not, I shouldn't say dealing with, but I'm working with the training of K through 12, right? Tell me what you want and I will give it to you, professor. I don't want to have to think extra because nobody wants to hear extra. And so the assignment sheet is very detailed. When I put that in, um, this was, it would have helped if I remembered which one if I used on each one. I do think I was still on Claude. You should care. Um, that's that cent the center um, line. You should care because no one is free when others are oppressed. This is why I need you to act. My sacrifice is hollow without the continuation of our movement. I ask that you pick up the torch of justice that you take to the streets and nonviolent protests. Call lawmakers to demand reform. This is not something that I don't think a student can write. It's not that I think that, and I highlighted that on my notes. Is it purple on there? I'm sorry getting, not helping me at all these glasses. So the fact that I'm, that I'm saying that I'm not trying to say that a student cannot come up with this kind of writing or my undergrad students are incapable of words that are considered SAT. It's not that. It's the feeling and the tone that is not strictly academic that comes from my students. So I have to say that I do get, um, some very creative students with this um, assignment. 
um, students that are creative who want to write dystopian novels, who've killed all of Congress, who've done all of these things. And so while that may in and, its, in and of itself tell me, oh, the student did not use AI for this, what I get more is interaction with the student. It's not to say that all of my examples are just, all of my examples are mostly um, this personal inference, inferential sharing from the students after reading certain texts that I find AI is unable to share. So even if um, I have an assignment that will utilize AI getting students to utilize AI for factual fact checking. I want you to utilize this. I want you to punch this into Claude and I want you to tell me what you've gotten. And then I want you to go back, give me an annotated bibliography on this topic, come back and tell me the differences. Where was it wrong? While that is very helpful and can show a student where, where the AI may fail them, it's not necessarily a foolproof plan to get them not to use it, if that were my um, objective. Instead, what it does, when they get their papers back, mom, don't cry for me, don't try to bail me out, this is where I belong, Maria would understand. Um, the rest of you that didn't get arrested, go blow up Congress. This is my blow up Congress student um, who gave me full permission. Um, they won't listen until we get physical. If we don't do something now, they will walk all over us in future generations to come. When students are engaged with their ideas, no matter sometimes how outlandish, and I do um, admit that I have a lot of flexibility in writing, in writing class, um, this is where the trust is built, where they are leaning less on AI, AI to give them an idea of what to write and more on just factual information that they learn to go and fact check. I think my examples, what I'm really trying to do in, show you in, in showing you these examples is the worth we're getting from engaging students in a different way to get them to give us their ideas in a way that is acceptable in academia, in a way that's building their skills, building their critical thinking, and or may or may not use AI in the process. Now, this is a trick for some of us teachers. Um, utilizing AI for lesser known texts. Now, canon authors, canonized texts, we can plagiarize all day. This is prior to AI as we know it, right? Sparknotes and all these other things that when we choose works that are not heavily, have not been heavily taught, they're not heavily canonized. AI, so interesting. Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the work, Joe Bell or Marga, that you mentioned, but it zooms in on the colonialism. Now, my students who hopefully, have read the piece. We're discussing the piece, and they're coming back with something more viable. We'll give something that, yes, they'll touch on the colonialism, but they will focus more on the character that spoke to them. When it comes to teaching writing, when it comes to teaching writing through a literary lens, we have a vast amount of power if we stretch ourselves to opening to the students' literature as well as the literature we want to teach. And I think this particular example is doing just that. How much time do I have, Adele? Five minutes. I'm going to skip this. Wine of Astonishment is a colonial, um, Anglophone colonial um, Caribbean piece. Um, AI knew this piece. It's a canon author in, in a Caribbean uh, literature. And when I asked AI to give me anything on colonial education, it's on point, right? The students have their own view of what colonialism is. And even though we're, it's, it's being taught in different, different disciplines, what I want us to focus on is our um, second AI return, um, the one on the bottom left. Um, he is disturbed by the racist disrespect shown towards Trinidadians working on the base. And then AI goes out on a limb, which I found very interesting. And this was after a couple of um, 
inputs, asking it to give me back more and more and more. And it says, as a Chinese American, I sometimes feel pressure to conform to Western norms. Now, I did not tell AI I was a Chinese American. Um, I did not uh, give any gender, anything at all. And it, and it came back with this. Now, as I said, prima facie, my examples are giving us the idea of how students may get caught out there utilizing it. But what I want to actually show is something a little bit more a little, a little deeper. In those three excerpts, we have students who are giving A, they may give their own um, examples. Ivan makes it known that he will do anything to become powerful, even abandon his Trinidadian heritage. He's told he's inferior and uses the system to prove he isn't. Personally, I see it all the time. People are fake and try to be who they aren't so they can seem rich and powerful. I see this in my friends and even in some family members. They wear the latest gear. I know what that means now. Um, it means clothing. Dr <laughs> Fancy cars, even when they can't afford it, to act like something they're not. Ivan is doing the same thing and everyone in the town can see right through him. I think what I'm trying to get at is, did I do that? I did. Thank you. I think what I'm trying to get at, thank you, Adele. What I'm trying to get at is, the value of student writing does not have to be eroded by what we think academia wants. If we can impart that to our students as trustingly as we can, building that trust every semester, and it's a lot of work, and it's not just work for us, it's work for our students, to, sh to give us that platform to say, what I have to say to you means something. Therefore, relying on AI a little bit less, or if not, if less is not the word, differently in that we're relying on AI to give us a, um, not ideas on who we want to be through our writing, but more so the foundational pieces of the context that they say that we believe they must have if they want to look up colonialism. And there's, we're, we're, in, a, we're in a time now where anywhere, Google, anything can give us those answers. And I think in Adele's earlier, um, when she opened up and she said she's listening to the students speaking, we have it right there. It's helping me a lot. It's great. Yeah, I need it. And I think if we can, through these examples, what I really want to show is that we can show, we can give our students a platform that they already have what we want. If AI is going to help bring it out, that's great, but they already have what we want. We just want to give them a clean vehicle to give that to us and their peers through their writing. Lastly, this one I found very, very interesting. Um, write, a pers write an essay on a personal experience with someone that changed your life. Now, once again, this prompt, very shaved down to fit on the slide, okay? The AI return. During my senior year of high school, I would frequently study at a local coffee shop near campus one evening as I was poring over textbooks. Now, I'm going to apologize in advance to the students in the room, but my colleagues had so much fun with this, with this paragraph because we said our students don't, would not admit to studying frequently at the coffee house and poring over textbooks. That doesn't mean, wonderful students, that you don't do that. I'm sure you do, okay? Um, and then at the end of that, tales of resilience that shifted my perspective. The coffee shop encounter taught me that we can make an impact on others. It is not that a student, once again, could not come up with this or could not say it in this way. It's after the discussion, after we've pulled ideas in class, after we have gone through things, the peer review and talking with each other, and then assigning something like this, that we're giving students the freedom not to think they need this from this platform. And once again, I, I want to say it's not that AI should not or cannot be used effectively in the classroom. So when I look at the student writing, and I had so many more examples, um, I couldn't help but ask her why she she uh, passed so many others. And uh, one of my students who went to India and I had to ask their mom, why you only, did you only help this one homeless person? Or um, other interactions with homeless people. Um, one student who, um, and once again, for the sake of the slide, who, um, and this is a very long time ago that I had a student who met a Holocaust survivor on the train. And things like that, that we are asking students to share with us in a literary way, which I think is the, the difference. 
But we're giving them that platform and that freedom to do it that way. AI can definitely help us, but I think what I would, what I would, what, if I could, if I could share anything through this this discussion today, is that if sometimes we can change or shift our way of engaging students to build a trust, that passionate word comes up every single semester on the. Um, teacher evaluations. If we can move toward that kind of teaching structure, and I once again, I, I, I admit I have a lot of latitude in writing, um, would give us a bit more, give our students a bit more confidence to say, AI can be great in this particular instance when it's about me. I don't need it. Um, thank you so much. I want to invite where she, my wonderful colleague, Lisa, up. Thank you. Yeah, so I've got some paper, and it's not because I don't trust computers, except that I don't actually trust computers, so it's a problem. Okay, so so how and why we use AI? So just kind of thinking through a few settings. So first of all, thank you everyone for being here and listening, but thank you also Adele for thinking of this panel and including me. I hadn't really thought to participate in this particular endeavor, and I was like, oh, well, that actually, that could be kind of cool. So thank you for, for setting this up for us and leading us to this panel. Okay, so how do I think about AI and how do I think about writing studies? So one, we're coming from someplace and we're going from someplace. So all the students are coming to the classroom from somewhere, it's not all the same place. And after the, my class, they're leaving the classroom and they're going someplace else, and that's not all the same place, which means that the role and importance of AI is going to differ for each of these people, even within the classroom setting, because we've come from someplace and we're going someplace else. So that goes for the AI and it also goes for writing. Like, what does writing mean if I'm putting air quotes up in my air quotes? All right. So the other thing for me to think about in terms of this, and this is something we've had some fairly, I've really been in, witnessed and been in some fairly heated debates about what the AI is doing. No, it's summarizing. I'm like, it's really, it's not, no. So AI is an algorithmic function. So the AI algorithms scrape stuff and they generate text and sentence-like objects based on statistical probability of stuff that it's got to process. So um, there's a rhetorical term that I learned from um, leading rhetorician Celeste Condit, which is called trained incompetence. And she told me about this. We were having a very difficult time with a copy editor at a journal. And she's like, oh, it's just trained incompetence, Lisa. And I'm like, oh, this poor thing, right? The poor, the poor human person that we were dealing with who didn't really understand what we were talking about. But um, AI is this. AI is trained incompetence. It's trained to do something, but it has no competence to back itself up. So what does Claude have to say about what Claude is doing? I thought this was interesting. So I asked it to describe itself as a writer, which is an assignment that I give to students. And it made a 500 word personal introduction without sexual content. Thank you. I was very grateful that I didn't have to deal with that content. It spontaneously offered this on the first try. Thanks. But it says that its role is to serve as a tool to generate content that is useful for human objectives. And it can synthesize information, summarize content, answer questions, and expand on ideas in my knowledge area. It's lying. It can't do any of those things because it doesn't have a knowledge area and it doesn't synthesize content. It like takes stuff and it mashes it up and it spits back out what's statistically probable. That's why in the keynote address yesterday, the keynote speaker showed an image and it's a little squirrel sitting next to a black granite fountain, which looks a lot like the Yale women's fountain to me. And it's got this, it's like black and it's got water reflecting and it's got like a little squirrel face and the AI is at 99%, that is a seal. And of course it's a seal to the AI because it's 99% probable. Squirrels don't tend to hang out near bodies of water, really. So like if you're thinking about what it has inside of it, that makes sense to me. So if we think about where students are going, this is one example of a space in which I interact that is not necessarily at Hofstra and it's necessarily not in the classroom. So um, WAMI is the World Association of Medical Editors and this is the ICMJE, which is the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. I am friendly with somebody who's on the board of WAMI who co-authored this um, chatbot generative AI piece. And it's like, what are the considerations? 
what is the AI you're using? Because there's a ton of them. It's not all chat GPT. It's not all Claude. There's not just one. What is it? What are you using it for? And then how do we accurately represent that in the paper? The one thing that they're agreed on is it's definitely not an author because these are physicians and they're like, yeah, no, it's not thinking. It's just kind of spitting out algorithmically thing, probabilistic. And then they will talk to a statistician because they don't really like talking in statistics language. But you still have that kind of interaction thinking about that. So when I start thinking about value for students, so faculty can help students evaluate the shortfalls in the AI generated language. So I'm like, that's kind of interesting. We can kind of help them pick up critical reading skills. They can understand the value of their own thoughts and experiences. So all the stuff that Sam was just talking about, they can comment on text critically and they can have a better ability to communicate about subject matter. So the value of their ability to, to communicate about subject matter comes home to them when they start seeing what an AI will generate. So here's a past assignment. So I taught an online um, WSC1 this summer, and there's all this concern about are they using ChatGPT? And I'm like looking at the text, and as Sam had pointed out, it's like you can kind of tell if like a human wrote it. And I'm like, this seems pretty human-y to me, but okay, I'm just gonna, I, I forgot to forbid them to use ChatGPT. And I'm like, okay, if you wanna use ChatGPT, put the prompt in, show me what it gave you, and then show me what you would have had to do to that to make it into an essay that you would be non-ashamed to hand into me, even as like the faceless faculty member who you're interacting with through um, Blackboard. So what do they have to do and how do they get it to an A? So it kind of makes them think about it. And I was like, it's really interesting because the students are willing to really kind of dig into and comment on the shortfalls of the AI. So if you have the handout, so Johanna Franklin from the math department and I, um, so she wanted to do this exercise in her class and she didn't want to have to set up a chat GPT account. And I'm like, well, that's I'll, I'll help you. So we got on Zoom one evening and we, we did this. So these are some things that her students gave permission for us to share today. And I just bolded the things that I thought were really interesting because these are things that in my experience one student is never, ever going to say that to another student they have to look at, but they're willing to say it to chat GPT. And I'm like, that's excellent because then they can make the incisive comment and then they can start to discuss. It's like, OK, this is crappy chat GPT, but how would I say that to a human person in a way that they can hear? So how can I think about nuance and audience and feeling like all the things, again, that Sam was talking about? So the things that I thought were great is. This may be interpreted as ignoring the initial prompt. And I love it. It's a math class. And we've got this kind of wonderful use of the passive voice going on, right? And, you know, it's like, okay, well, the essay is doing these things. But since there is no evidence to support your statements, like that's not 100% great, chat GBT. And then, you know, maybe you should have done a better job explaining rather than just mentioning terms all of which are things that we sometimes have to say to students, but we much more often have to say it to chat GPT because it really doesn't know that much stuff, despite the fact that it might claim that it has knowledge. Okay. So um, the other thing, and uh, I think um, Sam mentioned that we could kind of talk about canonical text. And I did double check this last night. There's like places you can go and look up what the AI has access to. Lord of the Rings is definitely in there, but Chat GPT still had a hashtag sad fail when I put this in. So um, I was uh, lecturing in honors college last semester and through a series of unfortunate circumstances, I wound up having to do an extra lecture on Lord of the Rings. And we were concerned about Chat GPT. I'm like, yeah, I'll just roll that in there. So I asked Chat GPT about Lord of the Rings and I got this little paragraph back and I was just fulminating and I'm not even really that big of a fan, but I was like, this is very wrong, but it's like the second most popular novel of all time. It's like, we can't even kind of get this right. So I have a few incorrect points here. There's a very, if the, if it's on the Padlet, I wrote a very lengthy rant that I read to the Honors College. And then I was like, okay, so, it, cause we were talking about interpretive communities and I was like, okay. So when somebody starts ranting like this at you about something that you don't care about. It's like, how do you cope with that circumstance is one of the, the things we talked about. But you can kind of think about this even in something that's really well established and really canonical and easily available to the AI, it still can't do it. 
this is another exercise that I mean, the Claude Chat GPT, they I mean, just face plant city. So the rhetorical pressy is a very well accepted way of introducing a text, but it requires a lot of analytical work. So you need to know the name of the text and who wrote it and when. You need to understand the purpose of the text, the audience being addressed, the methods that are being used to kind of reach that audience, and you need to make a comment on tone. There were, I got a lot of these wacky little hand wavy paragraphs, and I was like, well, I don't think that's a rhetorical pressy, Chat GPT. It was like, oh no, 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 a pressy is this. I was like, oh, <laughs> thank you, Chat GPT. So I kind of gave up and moved along. But I just thought this was really interesting. This is another assignment I often give to freshmen. It's like, can you do this for a series of texts? And then figure out like how would you work that into a paper? Like, what do you need to do to this to make it not sound like ridiculous? Um, Lenovo was recommending something to me. Sorry. Um, just gonna. Alrighty. Let's see what's going on. Okay, great. So if I think about some of the benefits of working with AI with students, we can uh, empower the students by using AI because we're now putting them into the position of the reviewer, of the commenter, of the grader. So we're kind of like taking out that piece that Sam is talking about. It's like, oh, just pass, here's my chalice of knowledge. Please passively fill it with the pearls of your wisdom. So we're gonna move away from that. We're gonna, you, you have your own pearls that you can make or you can evaluate ChatGPT and kind of think about why are ChatGPT's pearls not actually pearls so much as gumballs, right? So kind of thinking about that. Um, it also can enhance their writing literacy and their fluency and literacy with commenting on other writing. So they can see what they can identify these shortfalls and then they can figure out what they would need to do to overcome that. And they're just they're quite good at it once you kind of put this in front of them. And I've done these exercises in quite a number of different classes. Um, the other benefit to me is that AI is increasingly being used in workplaces. So the example that I've been using a lot because I've been hearing a lot about it is in pharmaceutical companies. So in many pharmaceutical companies, and this has been going on for quite a long time, you have to pull all this stuff together for regulatory documentation, and you need to have these little narratives just in case somebody needs them. You may have thousands of them to write. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to make your PhD level medical writers like sit there and go through all these different things and cobble these things together that no one will read. It's better to just have a computer pull a bunch of stuff and then have somebody double check them. So I was at a Drug Information Association conference last spring, and it's an expert on this. He's been working with this for years and years. He's like, no matter how narrowly we write the AI, no matter how much we direct it, no matter how much we limit what it can put out, it still makes things up because it's always working on an algorithm. So it's just going to go rogue. It's going to make the. It's going to claim to be a Chinese American, or it's going to, you know, become a, I don't know a cabbage or something, or it'll just like put the random things or like random vegetable names even potentially in the middle of something. So it always does need to be looked after. So our students will be encountering this technology in the workplace for most of the things we're training them to do. So anything that we can do that enhances their fluency and literacy in dealing with this is advantageous, not just in the classroom, but also in like the working world and lived experience. So if we, we can also think about the medical journal editor example that I gave. If you think about the statements that medical journal editors are making, they're like, how did you use the AI? Was it a method? Was it an editorial tool? Like, what is it? Were you studying the AI for some reason? So just those kind of focused questions help us all understand where we are and what we're doing. And it gets us out of this melodramatic binary AI, yes or no. Well, it's not friend or foe. It's like, it's a tool. So then what can we do? So it kind of opens the door to what we have options to do. Okay, so this is my last little slide. This is my keep in mind slide. And one of the things that I think is super interesting about PowerPoint, and I comment on it to my students all the time, PowerPoint inserts little images and icons all over the place. So when I wrote keep in mind, it's stuck in this little icon. I was like, oh, well, that's kind of nifty. I write about dinosaurs with a fair degree of frequency, and it's quite interesting what it will put in when you mention dinosaurs on a slide. Sometimes it's dinosaurs, sometimes it's tacos. 
And that's a, an interesting thing to comment on. It's like, okay, it's like, it says dinosaur. It has a library of dinosaur pictures. Why do we have a taco today? Like what happened that we have a taco? So you need a certain level of knowledge to see what's wrong with AI generated text. So in my Lord of the Rings example, I did show it to a number of people and they're like, Lisa, there's nothing wrong with that. And when I started telling them that they were like, oh yeah, you need to get out more. But it also was like, yeah, you know, I saw one of those movies. No one cares, Lisa. It's Hobbit-based knowledge. So you also, I guess, need to care. But it's difficult. Like, if it looks kind of right to you, you might not go any further. But we want to encourage students to kind of dig a little deeper and be actually sure. Um, AI uses an algorithm to generate statistically likely text and images. It's never reading and it's never writing. And as long as we keep that in the forefront of our minds, it will really help us figure out how to use it. So thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Lisa. I don't know how I follow that, uh, the dinosaurs and tacos, but I appreciate that. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to round this out. And this, I'm going to say, I, this, my journey into young adult literacy started in my home. I have four children. Uh, three are in college right now. And I watched as an educator, I watched as they went through their educational journeys, and I watched the one that was disassociated when they disassociated, the honesty with which they told me how irrelevant they felt that some of their coursework was or that they felt disengaged. My beautiful second son uh, stopped paying attention in second grade. He told his sister when she was in preschool, enjoy preschool, it's all downhill from here. <laughs> Which as a mother, it broke my heart for the next 18 years. I will tell you by the time he got, he's now 19, by the time he got to where he is, he's currently doing a co-op for the Air Force. He's creating um, training virtual reality and is thoroughly engaged in what he's doing because he feels it has value in their life. Except when I ask my students, I say, can you remember what you learned in high school? And they're very caustic for the most part about the minutia and the lack of engagement and the lack of respect for their opinions and what they thought and how they were expected to regurgitate things and they weren't asked what they felt and all of these things. And then they get into our classrooms, particularly our first, our first year students, and they sit there and they wait for you to tell them what to think, right? And they sit there and they want you to say, okay, tell me what you want me to say to you. And you spend a lot of time saying inflammatory things just to get a rise out of them so that they remember that they have a voice and that their voice needs to be heard. And so that's where I go to with artificial intelligence. We are going to have a segment of the population that is always going to look for that workaround. And why is that? I blame their previous educational experiences. I blame it because they never found the value in their education in some, or maybe we as teachers were unable or ill-equipped to impart to them what the value of that education is. And I'm not telling you to turn your, your, your classrooms on their head, but I am saying that we as educators have to show our students a pathway, A, to agentic literacy events where they are actually co-authoring those literacy events, but also that they find the value in what we're imparting to them. And that our classrooms are set up more collaboratively. As much, I'm not talking math. I can't remember a phone number. I apologize for that. But as far as critical discourse, I think we have to break some habits that have been accumulated over the years. So in that moment, I'm going to talk about our student population. I'm going to throw some theory at you. If you really want my references, I can, I can toss them to you. Pop me an email. But about our young adults, our young adults are not adolescents. And this is based on um, theorists who, especially uh, Erickson, 1968. And we talked about emerging adulthood. He said, we have to stop teaching our young, showing our young, young adults as adolescents. They're not adolescents. There's a distinct bridge. At, young adulthood can be seen as the bridge between adolescence and adulthood. And adulthood generally comes in your late 20s. Now, young adulthood, in a sense, where they're not, young adults are not the same as they were in prior generations because adolescents have more access to information 
And therefore, they're practicing literacy events and identity formation at a much earlier ages because they have unfettered access to information that they want. And they're able, without the interjection of teachers, to start identifying what they have as they see as value. We used to have much more control in our high school classrooms. We don't anymore because they have an entire, entirely different culture outside of the classroom, which probably has more value to them at that point. And also young adulthood, and I say this for my three oldest sons, my, <laughs> my three sons, young adulthood exists on a spectrum. I'm not going to identify number one as the same as number two. Number one's taking the long way around. It's usually pretty painful for me to watch. Um, but he's getting there, but he has to do it his way. Number two will do as I say, but only it, to the point that he thinks it's necessary. And number three will do anything I say as long as I'm watching. Once I'm not watching, he's on his way, right? And I won't talk about my daughter because she, she's a daughter. But it's on a spectrum. And I think when we have students come into our classroom, perhaps we forget about that. And we have students that, quote unquote, mis misbehave or distracted, call out or any of these other things. And we need to identify them individually that this is a spectrum. So first, I'm going to uh, there's a couple of theorists. Erickson in particular, he talks about a psychosocial moratorium and a psychosocial in a psychosocial moratorium for young adults. It's kind of it, it was facilitated by a post-industrial society. And it, it, it's kind of like a hiatus where you're allowed to try on and shed identities. You go through a, a bunch of iterations as young adults. You're always trying to find out who you are. You're trying on new information, trying on new ideas. You're taking in a lot of information that, quote unquote, interests you. That's what's seen as the primary way of identifying information from animals. We, we're interest seeking. We're interest seeking, seeking for growth. Uh, and Erickson felt that this psychosocial moratorium is what's happening in the college, is kind of indicative of what's happening in college. Then there's Arnett, and he talks about an emergent adulthood. In the same way, it's this feeling of in between. Okay, and again, we have to see our cl college classrooms as an identity quest. Everything that our students are doing in in our college classrooms. From the minute they walk into our classrooms, they are identifying us as an individual. They're judging us immediately. And then they're judging everything that we try to impart to them. They're even, they're judging, and, and there's a bunch of things, and we'll go into it in a second. But there's all these judgments that are happening, and they're trying to make sense of the stimuli that are coming in. And again, it's an identity quest. They're trying to determine who they are and who they're going to be. Schwartz takes it a little farther and he calls, talks about a dual pathway. Of course, you're going to, you know, those intrins, ex, intrinsically motivated uh, students in our classrooms. You don't have to worry about them. They're going to do what they're supposed to do. They're going to be right on point with everything. They're going to read everything very deeply, no matter what it is, ne not, even if it doesn't necessarily interest them. They might have their own motivations as to why they do things in our class and it's maybe the grade. Maybe they see their future most clearly. And again, they are going more directly towards adulthood. However, those aren't the ones I've ever been necessarily as concerned with. I teach at City University of New York, and this has been a, a growing problem, is retention and failed outcomes for our student populations. And a bunch of years ago, I started asking why. I said, why is this happening? You keep seeing this happen. And I actually went back to school specifically for this reason. And I went back for literacy because I felt that I was losing hold of my student population and I needed to find new ways to engage them or at least try to understand them a little better so that I can tailor my classroom to help these outcomes. Because the outcomes, for especially for the city, are um, heartbreaking. So there is this dual pathway. So I, I am focused on those students that tend not to see the value of their education, or they are failing in their outcomes, or they're sitting in classroom and not doing their classwork. And how do you reach those students? And that, I think, is the thing I would like us to focus on. So I'm a big fan of Desi and Ryan self-determination theory, and I think this is, again, part of identity formation. In the classroom, our students want to see mechanisms in place that foster autonomy, competence, and relatedness. 
So it's a communal environment. Autonomy is a big one, okay? It doesn't mean like go off and do your own thing, but recognize the subjective orientation of, of our student population and kind of help them along to co-author their literacy events. Uh, and competence, they want to feel that something, they're able to achieve something, that they're able to produce something that has value to them, to them, not to us. They may give us what we want, but that's called compliance. But whether or not they're engaged, how are we doing with that? And relatedness, this is a really important component. It really matters what your teacher, what your students think you think of them, okay? Do you care about them? Do you value their opinions? Do you have dialogues or are we lecturing at our students? So as part of self-determination theory, the, one of the core tenets is that everyone in life, mammals, anyone, have an intrinsic desire to learn and grow. Okay, if we're not having that happen in our classrooms, then there's a disconnect because it's not, again, not about that compliance factor. It's about what are they taking out of our, what are they taking out of our classes, classrooms and carrying with them? Okay, it, they may take your test and move on, but what will they remember that is of value to them and that they carry as part of their identity formation? So I'll ask, when do young adults become more engaged in learning? It's when they're interested in the content, okay? And that doesn't mean you have to cater to their whims, but you can impart to your students why they should be interested in this, how this information relates to them. That relating to the material is the primary factor, one of the primary factors for opening up engagement. And the key is to open up engagement so students are receptive to the knowledge that you would like to impart to them. So again, Sam, and at least I think Sam was talking in particular about trust and developing trust in the classroom. It's a big thing. In my the first couple of weeks of my class, it's all about developing trust and all about respecting my students as collaborators because if they don't feel that trust, they go outside your class. I don't know if any of you know this. They create group chats and they actually, if you're not doing your job right, they're actually participating in these group chats in your classroom, critiquing what you're doing in your classroom while it's going on. So if, again, and I'm always watching to see where is this engagement? How are my students engaged? And I usually flip my classroom so that the students are doing most of the work and I facilitate. I give them some something to do to pursue, but they are collaborating with each other and I'm helping them. It really matters. So it, during COVID, right before COVID, I was finishing my dissertation and I happened to get probably the last IRB approval going out the door right before COVID started. Okay, the negatives of COVID we got, but as a researcher, I felt incredibly grateful that this was approved because I spent the next two years online asking students what made them more engaged in material. And that first semester was really rough for a lot of people, but I kept my classes synchronous and we spent a lot of time and I have a lot of transcripts from students about the value of their education and when they felt that they learned best. Not that when they got good grades, but when they learned best and they said one of the primary ways that they felt they learned best is when they felt that their teacher cared about them. It was one of the, the, the biggest coded words that I had, that they feel that their teachers care about them. But they also need to feel that the material has value in their lives. And uh, again, because they exist on a spectrum, their development exists on a spectrum, they don't necessarily have the capacity to recognize the value, but we have the capacity to help them find that value. So it's a matter of how we, we, we prep our materials, our themes, and how we show the relevance of it in our students' lives. And the more engaged that our students are, the less likely they are to use ChatGPT or other workarounds. And I think that's what we have to focus on is not the oh, they're gonna use it, how are we gonna find out how they use it? No, we have to figure out ways to make our classes 
and pivot for this generation, this particular generation, which has huge sense of agency based on technology that has facilitated their development for the last 20 years. We can't put that in a box. And it, I think it's up to us, kind of the way the 1950s classroom needs to be thrown away with the rows and everything else. I finally, I was very happy to see Hofstra had wheels on some of their, de their desks. And this idea that you don't have to sit in rows and that you should be collaborating with each other to generate ideas. And then maybe they won't turn to ChatGPT. So for, for, from compliance to engagement, the teacher, in my view, should act as a facilitator. Okay, that, that authoritative figure standing at the front, in front of the room, lecturing to students, and always watch your students' eyes when you are talking to them and see where they go and which way, direction, because once they stop looking at you, they're not paying attention anymore. And we have to see young adults as collabor collaborators, okay? And that we're generating ideas together and that their ideas matter. And in this way, if they feel comfortable in your classroom, they're gonna speak up about those ideas. And I always argue that my writing class is not a writing class per se, it's actually a critical thinking class because when you're thinking about something and you're truly invested in what you're thinking in, writing is easy. It comes out so much e more easily because you wanna write about it. And that's one of the keys. And you have to activate student agency. And from my point, I, I, I create a workshop model I, I, I want the students, I don't want the students to look at me to tell them how to get something done. I tell them, this is the thing, go collaborate and figure out how you're gonna get that done. And think about this, you know, and think of five ideas that you feel are relevant or something that related to their lives. And finally, interest-driven choice, that's a big thing. Uh, it doesn't mean like let them run amok and go do anything they want, but there's certain value. I like to give them let them focus on a particular aspect. I like them to choose their own area of inquiry within a theme so that they could pursue something because I find when students have identified their area of inquiry, they again become more invested in what they're doing. And this is the last key component I'll leave with you. We have to recognize young adult learning, not compliance, not compliance, learning is part of identity formation. And if our classes have value, they're going to remember our classes. If they put it out of the head, which my students tell me often, it's like, oh yeah, I did what I had to, and then I just forgot everything. And if they're doing that, then we have to ask ourselves, I think, what are we trying to do? What are we trying? Are, are, are we focused on compliance events or on generating engagement and deep learning? So back to, as we end, I love it, proud. Of what makes a, a learning event memorable? Okay. Um, we have interesting, relatable, value, valuable, relevant, compelling, challenging, interactive, brainstorming, reflective journaling, confident, proud, invigorating. There's that agency, that sense of agency. When a professor is passionate, there's the focus on the professor. That experience is more memorable, intriguing, captivating, effective. Classrooms have been engaging when the professor has been energetic, humorous, and memorable at the right moments. As a student, traditional paper, <laughs> this is wrong moments, okay. Uh, as a, tradition, a student, traditional paper and in-person experiences help Though so online and generative AI increases rapid access to information. Interesting. That's a whole other topic. And so there we have it. And it, it, I'm going to leave it there. There's so much more to say. I do have a lot of research on this. I didn't throw a lot of names at it. But um, if you have any questions, I think now would be the time that we would um, take them. Thank you for your time.
Good morning. Good morning. Well, good afternoon. Um, my question is simply related to engaging students in the classroom and their imperative, imperative voice. Um, what are three trust building mechanisms that you've seen that work and that you would seek to implement in the face of AI? Um, I got that. Definitely transparency on the part of the professor. So if I am teaching and I am trying to sound like I know everything and the students know nothing, that never works, right? Um, transparency, sometimes even relating personal experiences. Um, one of the things on there was humor at the right time. I find that very interesting because I think I'm funny and everyone else doesn't. But um, when you are interacting on a more personal level, um, transparency definitely works in building that. Um, so that's one thing. I can leave the rest to my colleagues if they have any. Uh, just to build on that, uh, I, I spend a lot of time with icebreakers. I, I share, having four kids, I, I've shared a lot of anecdotes and sometimes in real time. Yes. Uh, and uh, in particular, <laughs> sharing those anecdotes, especially having college age kids, it, it, it shows, I think, that I'm going through this as well, and I see, and I'm very empathetic, obviously, to my own my own kids, but I remember once my, um, my two youngest, and I have an Apple Watch, for better or worse, and they were fighting, and it would just happen to be a conversation about uh, does, uh, does technology create disconnection within the family? And at that point, they went, and I didn't answer it, but 15 times my phone beeped and my watch beeped, and they were arguing with each other, and they wanted my intervention, and they, were, they just kept battling it out on the intervention. So we were able to use that as a moment of, this is how do you connect with your family? So it, I think by sharing those anecdotes and sharing that experience, and then it creates a bridge for students to share their own experience, I think. Um, that's an interesting question for me. I'm gonna say the most frequent piece of um, feedback I get from students is, well, you're not even like a real professor. I'm like, that's interesting. No, and it's it's always good, right? We're always, they're kind of like, this is great. This is, I'm like, well, I don't really quite 100% understand what's so great about it. But when I think about it, when I first started teaching, I had been working in industry for a long time. So when I dressed like a professional, I was quite frightening, apparently, to students. I was just a, this terrifying figure. And I'm like, oh, you know, I worked in a really pretty aggressive working environment. So I was like, okay, you show up in the classroom, you've got your Batman shirt on, you're wearing jeans, and you just kind of start asking the students, like, what they think. Like, what do you want to work on? What are you interested in? That experience to them of somebody kind of like, like dressing sort of like they would, although none of them apparently, well, few of them would be caught dead in a Batman shirt, apparently or so I've heard, this kind of idea that you can just kind of talk to them and see where they're at, and then you can kind of work in things about other stuff that you do, right? So if you're kind of leading with, I have a PhD and I was talking to the head of the World Association of Medical Editors this morning, which no doubt true, and even though I was talking to him about comic books and dinosaurs, like it's still scary, but if it kind of comes into the conversation in a natural way that you're respecting the fact that students are human persons and that their opinion is just as important as yours. I think that that is the, the thing. I want to say, right. lastly, it's validating those students' voices. And I yeah. think one of the things that um, students do when they do get comfortable enough to share, mm -hmm. um, the death knell to that is a professor looking at them and just moving on to the next comment. I think one of the things that we can work on when we're building that trust is validating those student voices. And I know the word safe space has become cliched and, well, we're a safe space, we're a safe space. Um, I think working in that way, when a student has shared something, validating that voice, um, when, it's an, when it's an opinion that might not be widely accepted, giving that opinion validation to the rest of the class. Um, sometimes we, we wanna shed a little bit of that authority, authoritative figure to, to the class, but they see us as an authoritative figure. And so when an authoritative figure validates a voice that may not even be as popular, mm -hmm. students see that and respect it. Um, so I think validating voice is also very important. Right. I, I, you're gonna make me think of one other thing. Um, I think we need to show, actual show our caring in a, a, a more tangible way. Um, I think in the last three years, at the end of class, I've had 
four students break down at the end of class. And they came, to, and I, I had asked them to stay and to tell me if there was something wrong because I, I've noticed a lack of engagement or they were disassociated. And I think, especially post-COVID, that a lot of students are feeling um, isolated but anxious. And just the act of asking, are you okay, has a lot of value. And I know, you know, does that belong in the classroom necessarily? But I don't think you can separate it because if you're going to have that type of environment where there is trust, you have to see each person as, as a person and be empathetic to uh, what's going on in their lives because it impacts their, 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 mm -hmm. their learning. So um, I think that's really important. Yeah, and I guess I would just add that you can think about this in terms of authenticity. So it can sound on the surface like I just twaddle about dinosaurs and comic books, but the last thing that I published on comic books is distributed by Cornell University Press. So that's like a non-shabby sort of a place to be distributing your work. And I just published a dinosaur-based piece. It was the first one in the technical communication literature. And it came out in a fairly top journal. And it makes a, like a big contribution to that field. So I'm working with some other researchers on forwarding that particular contribution. So you can also model for students in an authentic way. It's like, sure, you know, maybe you have an interest that, that seems a little silly, but you know what? It's it's something that you like. That that can have a value that's not just like fun, but fun things have a value for other kinds of endeavor. And then kind of also thinking about my friend uh, that I work with, who's part of that um, medical editor association. We literally do when I see him at a meeting. We hang out and we talk about comic books. So it's like also ways to connect with other human persons that are also authentic to those people and what they're interested in. Hi, um, I have a sort of speculative question, um, if, if you will allow me. So i um, really intrigued with um, all of these exercises for students um, that ask them to look at what AI produces and critique it in sort of interesting ways. And I think, you know, demonstrating exactly where all of these algorithms can go wrong and what, you know, the, the issues with tone are, et cetera. Of course, we're hearing that AI is going to be getting better and better, and it's already getting better and better. Um, and um, it will never not be algorithmic, uh, but it will get better and better. Um, I was just listening to an interesting story on a podcast about a new type of AI from, I think, Google called BART, um, and that trains on your own writing. Um, and so I think that when these models kind of, you know, marry the models that train on all the data available out there and that gets cross pollinated with, you know, AI that has trained on your entire Google mailbox and your entire text trail, they might start um, sounding very much like ourselves. And so, you know, the speculation here is, um, I think some of the techniques we're using are going to have to evolve with the AI. And I'm wondering, you know, you know how you've been speculating about these things. Um, and also what it is doing to our understanding of what writing is. If it is not, um, and I completely agree, <laughs> writing is not um, algorithmic. It's not, it's, it's not what it is. What is it? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we, we, your point, I, I, it's close to keeping me up at night, but not yet. <laughs> I think um, we definitely have to morph. There's no question about it. We're morphing with it. And, and I know I'm late to it, right? It's only been three years for me. And, and I know Adele has been saying it's, Samantha, you're way behind. So it's, you know, for the past three years, I've been changing. There, It's the days of keeping the syllabus the same and, and doing everything. that It's so long gone. I don't have an answer as to how. I can keep up. But what I can say is that BART, and you're 100% right, what I can say is that what we think writing is has to change. I don't know what we're going to think it is. I remember when I was growing up and you, the cal using a calculator was, what's the word? English Anathema. professor can't, oh, yes. <laughs> and, and, and now it's, 
everyone has a calculator. Anyone has a calculator on their phone, but calculators are allowed in school. And so what math is, two plus two will always be four. Just like you're saying writing, the algorithm will not be writing. How, we're, how we change with it, unfortunately, I have to be honest and say I am, tough and I am definitely reactionary. When, it, when I'm learning, when I'm seeing what it's doing, when I'm teaching my students and we're doing it together, tell me what you're seeing. When Bart, how is this just like you? So when you ask me to speculate, I can only say each student, it's going to be so much more touching each and every student to find out when they're telling me this learn this is learning me it does sound like me or it does not sound like me what do you like what don't you like about it speculating at this point can only be touch point it, for me but once again i'm reactionary i am i do not know what is coming it's just hurtful and i know <laughs> adele you know it's like sam you've got it sam you know and and so reactionary for me. My speculation is definitely, it's going to come with the students as they grow and I grow with it. Each semester is going to change. Each semester is going to tell me how I have to change my teaching style or how I have to change some sort of work. It may not even be prompts anymore. It just it just has to change. I, 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 as you we were talking, I was, I'm very excited about the technology. See, she's excited I, and I'm I, petrified. This, this is, is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm terrified. Two of them, and they said, I don't know what it'll never be. I'm, I'm, I'm looking over the horizon, and it's like technology. I think technology is just blowing us away. Uh, my godson, where I started this journey, he called me um, last year. I said, hey, he's an artificial intelligence major at the University of Wisconsin. And we were talking about this, and he said they're having the same issue with coding because now it's coding. And now what does that mean for coders and, and all of these things all along? So it, it's, it's, it's transferring and there's a lot of uncertainty about it. Uh, from, from a writing perspective, I, I, I go back to the idea, if that's what we're thinking about, it's like, okay, well, if, if I'm a writer and this is writing, and then where does my job go? Or what, what is the value of writing? Uh, and I go back to my city students who, if I haven't, convince them of the value of writing before the first week, they'll stop to coming Done. to class. And, and they don't even, Agreed. my Hofstra students, they come to class. There's attendance and everything. They'll stop coming to class. I'll have, if I haven't done my job right, they'll, and I haven't imparted to them, stick with me. I know you have struggles, but it's not about writing. It's about how in 10 years, from a literacy perspective, you're going to be able to advocate for your family so that somebody can't take advantage of you. And if I haven't convinced them of the value of what I'm trying to tell them before, at the beginning of the class, then it doesn't matter the future. It, writing will, yes, artificial intelligence will always bring writing someplace, you know, to say, like, oh, it's writing for us. But for me, I feel like it's the critical thinking, it's the literacy. And we have a population of students who, if they're using AI for that purpose, they're purposefully choosing to be illiterate. <laughs> okay, they're purposely choosing not to learn to express themselves in a rhetorical way that's going to help them in the future. They're looking at the short game and they're not seeing the long game. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather do a better job convincing them so that when AI comes and we're integrating in whatever capacity, the, the sanctity of my classroom is still going to remain. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. my passion. I'm, 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 I'm the one that's been like with pom poms. Oh my that's gosh, okay. killing us. Um, so what I start thinking about is um, social justice and the divisions on the planet. So I was on a panel on Sunday and we're talking about AI and accessibility to an audience of people that is mainly from the global south. And you know, people are kind of talking about AI and keeping caught up with China. And I'm like, that's really rough for researchers who are working in communities where like the next technology that the most people need is shoes, right? And like, that's a lived reality for a lot of people. Like they need shoes for their kids and then they need a bicycle so that they can get things to market and they don't have electricity, right? So the researcher only has electricity on alternate Thursdays when they're able to get back to the city. So for me, it's like, I would think that we need to start considering that, sure, there's these kind of meteoric rises in kind of replicating the text the textual experience of privileged people, but then what does that do for the rest of the world? And then how do we as responsible moral humans think about the ways that we need to intervene in order to make this planet a better place? So each time there's a new development, it opens the possibility for that conversation again, I think. 
So I was just going to comment. I think one of the strengths that I really appreciated about this panel is, you know, collectively you've leaned into it and not stepped away. And I think what's fascinating and very powerful is that you're all, as you've just shared, coming from it from, in some respects, very different places, optimism, terror, and, and someplace, <laughs> someplace in between. But I, to, and to your point, to just share that with the students in the classroom and to really treat the students in your classroom as the, the, the intellectual partners that they are. I mean, that, you know, I mentioned earlier this morning that it was said yesterday, the genie's out of the bottle. So yes. th we're not going back to gotcha. something that's a pre- Generative AI, but the, the question I have, maybe Sam, this is this is for you because I, I think the example you gave, I was very compelled by in the context of that kind of very personal expressive writing. Yes. But there are obviously very different types of writing. As yes. you think about technical or scientific writing, um, I'm curious in your thoughts as to whether generative AI has has a place or not and where that place might be? I'd be a fool to say it doesn't have a place, right? <laughs> so it has a place. Um, how we're doing, so for our technical writing, even business writing, um, because I have colleagues um, who use it to compose emails, right? So from that standpoint, I'm really looking at it as a tool. I did use most of my uh, presentation on my more free, and I did preface that this is my freedom class and I can do that. But when it comes to the technical writing, um, first year writing, uh, business writing classes, I'm using that more as a tool to um, have students utilize it. I have them use it, utilize it. I like Claude better than ChatGPT. Um, I shouldn't, oh, I like Claude better. Uh oh, she's rubbing off on me. Um, and so I use that in the class. And what I do is simil similar to having them um, utilize Claude and, and then, and I don't do that. This is an in class. So this is where old meets new. They bring, or they can do, they bring their um, AI generative piece, and I force them on pen and paper to take that. On one sheet, you're critiquing it, and on the other sheet, say what you would have written without this. Now, reactionary, right? Because the student now is taking what AI has already given them and has already said this is correct in their minds, right? I'm trying to move back from that. Um, this semester, I'm not teaching um, in, in any of my uh, schools um, um, instructional writing that way. But what I did learn from that particular um, class was that I have, I want them to do the pen and paper first. This is almost counterproductive because at that point I am saying I will not grade your syntax because they're telling me I can't, I can't fix this, fix this, right? So it's pen and paper. Tell me how you would write a business email. Tell me how you would write. Um, and those are the smaller things. Go to AI, come back, and now critique it and tell me where you're writing and that writing different. Which do you like better? And it's all, and Prior, when I did that last semester, time is going by, we're already in the fall, spring um, at another institution, it was what don't you like about um, Claude's writing for technical writing? I have not, and I'll be lying if I have not gotten past 50% of, no, I love Claude's writing. I have not gotten past that. It's, 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 it's slow. Um, it's, it's perfect. This is what my boss wants. This is what we want. I don't see what the problem is. And if everyone, it's, it's, I, I really liken it to the calculator. It's going to be, I, I work, my full-time position is actually dealing with top donors at St. John's University. We write letters for the president. We write letters for the vice president. And the assistant, I should probably, probably shouldn't say it. Yeah, right. Um, uh, someone mentioned to top people, oh, you just use chat GPT. And so thinking of that and then going back to my classroom for technical, what you're saying, it's dichotomous, but it is a tool and I must use it. Um, and I do, but getting students to recognize the value in their writing outside of reflective writing is a much more difficult process. Mm -hmm. Just to that point, anecdotally, my nephew and I, he oh, calls me in the middle of the night to have me help him with his science writing. Um, just and he was told specifically by one professor that he should, and before me, not because of me, um, that he should engage an editor. 
for his essay for his art essays that he was writing for class. The per, the the professor purposely said, "Go get somebody else to help. Go get somebody to help you write your paper, your ideas, but have them." And this is this is again yep. the spectrum of professor. You know, and I asked my sons before this happened, and I've gotten everything from "Don't even tell me if you used it; it's okay," or "You can use it to get you started," or, or and so, you know, again, we ha we haven't standardized our viewpoints on it, so we're, it's the wild west right now, mm -hmm. and it AI is getting to the point where you can put in writing samples and say generate writing in this style. So it's going somewhere, um, but again, if we're focused on the writing and not the ideas. It's kind of like the cart before the horse, I think. We have to get them to generate the ideas. And then maybe they want to write it themselves. I say every time you rely on chat, even in the bit my business writing class, every time you rely on chat GPT to write your product for you, you become disinvested in your goal. It's, it, you are, it, whether it's the passion you have to exude in your cover letter or you, chat GPT will never do that for you. And it will reek of chat GPT when you produce it for whatever, unless you're doing an SEO where you have to generate content for the internet which all reeks of chat GPT now. Mm -hmm. And you, it's actually a turnoff. I think, you know, we have to show them it and they themselves will come to the idea of, wait, this doesn't represent me. Again, that identity issue. Like this, this isn't me. So. Well, I'm just going to offer like one thing, which is if we go back to the opening question that Adele started us off with, which is like, where's the value? So you need to think about like what's the value of writing whatever you think that is in each different domain. So in a technical communication domain, maybe the value is that you've got a bunch of cookie cutter pieces and you're swapping out a data set so that you want it to be predictable and algorithmic because the goal is to be able to churn that into a meta analysis. So maybe it doesn't have any of those values, but maybe you're writing something to there, there's something that goes on in, in um, pharmaceuticals called a health technology assessment. So you're balancing out scientific material, clinical efficacy, but then broader modes of social justice and resource allocation. And you need to be able to build an argument. So, you know, ChatGPT can run a report for you that kind of houses your data, but it can't really write something effective from a health technology assessment standpoint because there's too much analysis. So it's like, Where's the value of putting in the work, I think, is one thing to think about. And then, again, if we go back to my social justice um, example, it's like these offer us an opportunity to have these conversations and to figure this out. Like, when does it make sense to automate? When does it not? And then we can kind of bring these conversations to our students so that they're building up kind of a critical repository of critical thinking. But the last thing, because we're just about out of time, but uh, Charlie, you commented on the range of folks. I just want to shout out to Ethna Lay, who's sitting in the back here, who hired all of us into our department. So um, I think it's a testament to Ethna's leadership that we have such a variety of folk in the department and that we're able to have these rich conversations. So thank you very much. There was a question. I thought you had a question, and I didn't know if you wanted to ask. Are you a student in the back? Yes. I wanted to give you an opportunity. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Oh, no, that's okay. Yeah, so I'll make this quick. I was just ruminating off of, I believe, you said. Me. And what it means, like, uh, how do I want this? When, I mean, what one of you was saying, I don't want to hear what the internet has to say. I want to hear what you have to say. And. Sounds like you. I think about. <laughs> I think about a computer science class I took a few semesters ago about game programming and the art of games and that type of thing. And it was an intro class, and you know, I was taking it as part of a gen ed requirement. And it was a very open ended class. Like we had a textbook to learn about the more programming side of things. And we had assignments, but the class time itself was very loose, and the professor would show up and say, hey, I'm here if you need me, but here's, here's the assignment, you know, here's what we're trying to learn today. Go you know, be loose. And 
anything that anyone took from the class beyond that was entirely on them. And the passion kind of had to come from you, like it wasn't, and the assignments were easy, so to speak, like it was just programming and art and that type of thing. And that's really what comes to mind, like you know, that course still resonates with me in terms of Normally, open-ended classes are you know, scary because it's like, you know, what, what do I do? You know, what do I learn and how do I learn it? But that professor's approach is like, you know, hey, if you want to if you want to learn something in this class, you can go ahead and you learn it. I'm right here, but I'm not going to force you to learn, you know, force you to turn to essentially cheating, you know, because there, there was no way to cheat in that class, essentially. And I feel like when it comes to students turning to chat GPT or you know, spark notes or, or something before that, you know, the students who are interested in learning will find a way to do that when the professors allow them to, assuming that there's not already something on their plate preventing them from focusing fully on that class because right. there's been semesters where I just can't and where I do phone in assignments or I do just tell the professor what I, what I think they want to hear because I have a grade to get because I have a million other things going on. Yes. Mm -hmm. But that computer science class really resonated with me because, or I guess I don't really have words for it other than what I've said, but yeah. Mm -hmm. To that point, it reminds me of my third son in his senior year. He's now a freshman in college. He's an engineering student. He finally came home, and sons don't say a lot to you, but he finally came home, and for the first time yeah, last year, he told me how excited he was about a class. And it took him until senior year. And we loved his school and everything, but the class was just that. It was an engineering class where the professor, the teacher taught, said, think of a problem that you could potentially solve with engineering, and we're going to spend the entire year helping you to develop a solution to that problem. I'm here for you, and I will give you the tools that you need or the learning that you need, but I want you to come up with the problem, present the problem, and then as you're needing the materials that you need to attack that problem, I'll give you the instruction that you need. And it was completely student-driven, and he was so excited through the entire year, and he probably learned more in that model of school than he might have learned listening to a lecture or going through a textbook piece by piece. So I understand exactly what you, it is that you're saying, and I totally agree with you. Very glad that you shared yes. that yeah. experience. I think you're really just talking about empowerment, and you were empowered. I think one of the things we have to remember is that, as Adele was saying, we're building students to be leaders, to lead their own lives, whether they advocate for their families or not. But I think your empowerment, you just shared how you were empowered. Um, and I find it brave. It's scary, right? Right. Because it is scary to share. Like I just, You just told us you do give professors what they want. I need the grade because I'm too busy. And we realize that no matter what you think, we did go to undergrad too. Like we were all in college at one point. And so we totally understand, but I think your bravery in sharing that empowerment is very special and I thank you. Yes. I think we have to conclude. Thank, thank you. you everybody. Thank you for everything. Yep, we're on. We're out.